is uh, Dr. John Cassano. He's an atmospheric scientist at CU Boulder um, and has spent the past, has spent several months this winter uh, in the Arctic as part of the Mosaic Expedition. We're excited to hear from him today and, and hear about his experience with Mosaic. So thanks, John, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, so I wanted to, to give all of you maybe um, just a, a brief view of what it was like being involved with um, Lake Three of Mosaic. And so uh, this first picture is me um, on the Mosaic flow um, in early March when I first arrived at the Polar Stern and you can see the Polar Stern in the background. Um, and so let's see. Okay, um, so we all know what Mosaic is. Um, I really like the followmosaicexpedition.org website that I have listed here on the top left. Um, I, I've been following it pretty religiously every day since the expedition started. Um, the map on the right is from that web page, and so you can see where the ship is at any time. Um, the gray is the uh, polar stern as it was transiting, so initially from Norway up to the, the ice flow, and then the blue is the scientific drift with the ice flow, and then the gray is when it came out um, in May and went to Svalbard. So um, I joined the expedition uh, he, about here. Can you all see my cursor? Um, yeah, so, yes. okay. So uh, I joined the expedition. It was uh, north of 88 degrees north. And I left the expedition um, about here. Um, so about half of the mosaic drift took place in the um, month and a half that I was on board the ship. Um, there are five science teams, atmosphere, ice, ocean, biogeochemistry, and ecosystem. I was uh, one of the atmospheric scientists. And so my mosaic journey, I left the US on January 22nd, um, flew to Tromso, Norway. Um, we had four days of training there and then boarded the Captain Drenitsen uh, on the 27th of January. And so um, a few pictures to show this first part. Um, so that's me doing uh, sea ice training in Tromso. So um, we had to jump into a just barely not ice covered fjord and practice getting ourselves out of um, the water using ice picks. So that's uh, what I have in my hands. And they're just metal stakes that you would use to dig into the ice to climb out if you um, fell into a lead while you're on mosaic. Uh, and then uh, this is the uh, Drenitsen, uh, just before we boarded the ship, so it's in port in Tromso. Um, I expected this was going to be my home for about two weeks. Uh, it turned into about five weeks uh, living on board this ship. Um, and so we boarded the ship on the 27th of January. Um, we sailed for about two hours and then uh, sheltered in a fjord north of Tromso for five days, um, waiting for some storms to pass through the Barents Sea so we would have a relatively smooth crossing to get to the ice. Um, and so this was our home on the Drenitsen for five days or the view from the Drenitsen for five days. So it was a very uh, nice location to be sheltering. Um, I got to see the Northern Lights. Um, this was the only time on the trip that I did see the Northern Lights. So that was um, both nice that I got to see them and a disappointment that I didn't see them any other times uh, the rest of the trip. And like I said, we sheltered in the fjord for five days, waiting for some storms to pass so we wouldn't have too rough a crossing of the Barents Sea. Um, despite that, we still got into three to five meter seas that put a lot of ice onto uh, the Drenitsen. So this is on the um, deck of the ship and the Russian crew breaking off all of the ice that has accumulated in the 36 hours we were in open water going from Norway to the ice edge. Um, we arrived at the polar stern on the 28th of February, about two weeks later than expected. And at this time, the polar stern was north of 88 degrees north. And in fact, the polar stern, um, just a few, about a week earlier, had reached its furthest, furthest north point of the drift. And that was the furthest north that any ship had ever drifted um, in the Arctic ice. And so once we got into the ice in the Drenitsen, um, we spent uh, about three weeks sailing north to reach the polar stern. The ice was very thick. Um, the picture here is 
basically what the view looked like for three weeks. So we had um, ice and you can see how thick the ice is um, right here that the, the ship is breaking through. It was uh, you know, consistently more than one meter and, and often close to two meters with ridges bigger than that. Um, the Dranitsyn really had struggled to get through the thick ice. Um, so, you know, we might travel, you know, 10 or 15 miles a day um, on, on some of our rougher days. Um, and it was uh, dark most of the time. We had a little bit of twilight at midday, um, but the sun, we sailed north of uh, the last sunrise um, pretty quickly. So we were in polar night conditions for this entire transit on the Dranitsyn. Um, spent a lot of time on the bridge of the ship. So this is a view from the bridge of the ship. Um, we had, you know, several spotlights that let us see where we were going. Uh, the orange ball here is a uh, full moon. Um, so it was low on the horizon or just uh, above the horizon. So it had this orange glow like you'd see uh, when the moon first rises. Um, the difference is that the moon stayed about that height above the horizon all day. And so we just had this orange ball of the full moon uh, that circled the ship all day, which was uh, very cool to see. And then eventually, the end of February, we, we reached the polar stern. So this was um, really a very welcome sight. Everyone was uh, super excited to get here. Um, it was still uh, polar night, but you can see that we were starting to get a bit more twilight at this time. So this was um, by far the most beautiful time of the expedition that we had. You know, a bit of color in the sky. Um, really a, a nice time to be up in the Arctic. And so, um, we had about five days of uh, handover with the leg two people um, and getting us moved over to the polar stern and, the stern and then moved over to the Dranitsyn to sail home. Uh, so Mosaic leg three, the science uh, really began around March 4th. I was working with a CU graduate student, Gina Joseph, um, and we were doing um, unmanned aircraft flights, um, uh, drone flights to study the Arctic boundary layer. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what the boundary layer is in a moment. Um, we had some technical issues with the planes early in leg three, but generally um, really good performance given the conditions we were working in. And the environmental conditions were really challenging. When we first arrived the first couple of weeks, it was you know, consistently below minus 30 degrees Celsius with temperatures down to uh, minus 40 degrees Celsius. At the end of the leg temperatures warmed up to almost zero degrees Celsius. And we had some real strong winds, you know, more than 25 meters per second, you know, 50, 60 miles an hour. Um, a lot of storm conditions during the one and a half months that I was on the expedition. And the ice became very dynamic in the last month that I was there with lots of leads opening up that made working on the flow um, very challenging. We didn't expect to face that challenge during a winter leg of mosaic. We thought the ice would be very stable, that it would be um, much easier to work, uh, but it wasn't. Um, so here's uh, Gina and I uh, out on the flow. Uh, the, the foam uh, aircraft here is uh, one of the data hawks that we brought. So it's uh, just a remote controlled plane. It's powered by batteries, has an electric motor. Um, it launches off of these uh, orange rails that you're seeing here. There's a bungee cord attached to it pulls the plane off of the launch rails and then the motor starts up and it flies and, and makes measurements. And I'll show you a video of what this launch looks like in a little bit. One of the challenges we faced was that the bungee cord didn't really like the cold temperatures. And so um, as the temperature would change day to day, the amount of stretch in the bungee cord and the amount of pull that it would give um, really varied a lot. And so it made it challenging for us to get the plane off the ground successfully. We eventually found good ways to do that, but it, it took a bit of time. Um, this is a picture um, looking out towards one of the um, science cities on the flow. So each of the different science teams had a, a bit of the flow where they were making their measurements. This is uh, the atmosphere team. Um, so this is Met City or Meteorology City. Um, and so uh, there are a bunch of instruments out on the ice. Um, but what you see here is this dark blue line is a lead that opened up about two weeks after we arrived at the polar stern. Um, and this was a, a pretty big lead. It was too wide for us to get across um, any other way than flying with the helicopter, which you see in the background. Um, just the day before this lead had opened up, Gina and I had finally gotten 
Um, everything set up to do our flights, air flights that we want to do with our drones were going to take place just behind uh, Met City. And this lead forced us to reevaluate those plans because now it became very difficult to get out to our site. And we eventually relocated our uh, runway in what we call Droneville uh, to be on the near side of this lead, closer to the Polar Star. Um, and so I'll show you um, our first successful flight. So this took us about two and a half or three weeks of being on the Polar Stern, working through those initial technical problems um, to finally get our first flight. Um, so you'll, if you hear the video, you'll hear that Gina and I are pretty excited um, once the plane takes off. Great. I'm ready whenever you are. I'll count you down. Three, two, one, go. Did you take it? Yeah, so um, when the plane took off, the bungee didn't quite give it enough stretch. And if you were watching closely, you'd see the plane almost touched the snow surface. Um, and then you could hear the motor, the pitch of the motor change. And Gina asked me if I had taken it. So what she was asking was, did I switch from autopilot, which is how we normally would do our takeoffs where the plane was just controlling everything. Um, and she was asking if I switched into manual control where I was then controlling the plane with uh, the remote control. And I had switched into manual because I could see that the plane wasn't, was going to hit the ground. And so I switched into manual, gave it full throttle, and was able to, to pull up and get the plane into the air. Um, the day before this, we had what was going to be our first launch, and the plane pulled off of the launch rails. The bungee cord was too cold, and it, the plane basically hit the ground about 10 feet in front of the launch rail. So it was a very uh, disappointing attempt of our first flight. Uh, okay, and so uh, at the end of this first flight now, I'll show you um, the landing. And so the, the plane just uh, lands on its belly, just slides across the snow surface. And so you see the plane will come in uh, from the left side um, and land from left to right across this image. And so the plane is just coming in now and yep, it touches down. Gina and I are super excited. Way to go. We did it. Woo! First flight. Success. The planes work. <laughs> yeah, and so we had a whole group of paparazzi out watching us for this first flight, which added a lot of stress um, to have a bunch of spectators watching us. Um, but the first flight really went well. Yeah, and uh, this is one of the pictures from uh, the paparazzi that were watching us. And so the, the reason we were doing these flights um, was to make measurements of, of the atmospheric boundary layer. And the boundary layer is just the bottom, you know, several hundred meters to maybe a kilometer of the atmosphere. Um, and it's the part of the atmosphere that interacts with the underlying surface, whether that's sea ice or open water, if you have leads or land or, you know, whatever is underneath the atmosphere. And it's really a, a critical part of the atmosphere because it's where all of the exchange of energy and moisture and trace gases and momentum takes place between the atmosphere and whatever is underneath it. And so the boundary layer um, really modulates, you know, how much energy gets into the sea ice and controls, you know, how much melting or freezing takes place, but it also modulates how much en energy is escaping from the ocean and getting into the atmosphere and how warm the atmosphere becomes. Uh, you know, the momentum transfer is important, you know, as we get storms that are passing through in the atmosphere, the, the energy from the winds, the momentum from those winds gets transferred to the sea ice and then causes the ice to move and deform and break. And so if, if you want to uh, study the polar climate system, you know, in the coupled system from the ocean through the ice and into the atmosphere, the boundary layer is really what's modulating how the atmosphere is interacting with those other parts of the climate system. And so Gina and I were making measurements of temperature, which is what's shown here. And so all these lines are just temperature profiles from different flights. Um, but we also measured humidity and winds and turbulence that will allow us to um, really understand how the atmosphere was interacting with the, the sea ice and the leads that form. And while I was on leg three, while we were on the polar stern, we saw the sun rise for the first time. Um, so this is the first time I had seen the sun in about six weeks. Um, 
I hadn't really missed it or I didn't think that I had missed it. And I walked up onto the bridge of the polar stern on this morning and the sun was sitting there above the horizon and it was um, really a lot more emotional to see it than I had expected because you know we had twilight and it, it wasn't a big deal and I've been in polar night conditions before. Um, so it's kind of nice to see the sun again. And you can see some of the leads that were present, the open water uh, extending away from the front of the ship. Um, and like I said, we had a lot of storm conditions. So this is uh, me out at uh, Droneville. So we had a tent that we set up that we uh, use as our base of operations uh, getting, for getting the plane ready to fly. Um, and here the winds were blowing about 40 miles an hour. The temperature was about minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so a pretty unpleasant day to be out. And we were just um, securing everything at Droneville to make sure it didn't get blown away as this storm progressed. And then I also said one of the challenges we faced were um, the leads. And I showed you a picture of uh, that first lead that opened up that separated Met City from the rest of the mosaic flow in the ship. Uh, this picture was taken just the day before I left leg three. And uh, several leads had opened between the polar stern and Droneville um, that made it really difficult for us to get out to our site. Um, and just a couple of days after I left, Droneville was taken down from this site. It became inaccessible because there was too much open water. So the end of leg three was supposed to happen the first week of April. April, that was what was scheduled. Um, uh, planes were going to fly from Svalbard up to the polar stern, land on a nice runway, bring the leg three scientists back to Svalbard, and then from there we'd go uh, back to our homes and the leg four people would come up. Um, but of course, COVID had other plans for us. Um, and so the Avi, the organizers of Mosaic, worked really hard to, to find a way to get the leg three to leg four transition to happen. They looked into bringing other icebreakers to do this transition. And um, all of those plans eventually fell through because of COVID restrictions in terms of what ships were, able, were allowed to come and sail to us, basically none, um, and what countries would allow us to uh, enter their or uh, come across their borders. Um, so eventually, for seven of the, the leg free scientists, uh, Avi arranged a flight of a small uh, bush plane, a twin otter aircraft, to fly in and pick us up uh, from a sea ice runway at the end of April. The polar stern stayed on the mosaic flow until April or until May 15th, and then sailed to Svalbard to exchange uh, crew and scientists for leg four. That exchange took place just a couple of days ago, and now the polar stern is sailing back. Uh, into the Central Arctic ice pack to reestablish the, the, the ice camp. Um, so this is the plane that I flew out on. This is a Twin Otter. Um, I've flown in these before in the Antarctic as well. Um, it's, it's a really good uh, plane for deep field work. It doesn't require a lot of uh, length for the runway to take off or land. And uh, to get home from the polar stern was a, a three-day trip for me. So I started uh, up here on the polar stern, which was at this point sort of between Svalbard uh, to the east and Greenland to the southwest. Um, and so the Twin Otter flew up, landed on the sea ice next to the polar stern, picked uh, seven of us up. From the polar stern, we flew to Station Nord, which is a Danish military base on the uh, northern tip of Greenland. Um, we spent the night there, and then we continued in the Twin Otter um, from Station Nord, flew across northern Greenland to Eureka on Ellesmere Island. We re refueled there. We went to Resolute Bay. We uh, switched to a uh, Basler DC-3 aircraft, a bigger aircraft. Um, from there, we flew to Arctic Bay, and then to Churchill, and then to Toronto. This second day of the trip from Station Nord to Toronto, uh, it took us 21 hours, and 19 of those hours we were in the air flying. So it was a really long day. And then um, from Toronto, it flew commercial for, uh, to Chicago and Denver. Um, it was pretty surreal coming back into a COVID world after having been on the polar stern and not social distancing and you know just acting like a normal person. Um, and arriving in Chicago midday on a Friday and seeing just a handful of people walking through the terminals was, you know, it's just so surreal. Um, and the same thing when I landed in Denver. Um, and so uh, just a couple of last pictures to end this journey. Uh, so this is uh, flying over one of the fjords in northern Greenland. Um, and then uh, when we landed on Elsmere Island in Eureka uh, to refuel. Um, so it was just 
a nice runway with a couple of fuel barrels that we siphoned some fuel into the, the Twin Otter and continued on. So um, hopefully that gives you a sense of what it was like being involved in leg three. And I guess I'm happy to take any questions now or yeah, whatever discussion you guys want to have. Wow, thanks, John. That's an incredible story. Um, yeah, thanks for being. I'm sure there are questions if you have a few minutes to take some. I think probably the best way to do it is if people raise their hands uh, and that, and uh, we can we can make it happen that way. Okay. Yep. That sounds great. I'll just go ahead and ask. Um, so at this stage, you're working with your data. And mm -hmm. so what sorts of, uh, I, I, like anything that's coming out right now from your data that um, you're excited to see or is of particular interest, something that maybe um, surprised you from mm -hmm. um, what you've been able to collect in your data? Um, I don't know anything that's really surprised me so far in the initial looks of the data that we've had. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I was sort of happy to see, um, so one characteristic of uh, the boundary layer in the polar regions is that um, normally in the atmosphere, the temperature decreases as you move up, right? So if you go, you know, from Boulder where I live up into the mountains, it's colder up in the mountains than it is down in Boulder. Um, but the polar regions a lot of times have a temperature inversion where the temperature gets warmer with height. Um, and so we measured some um, really strong temperature inversions. And those temperature inversions have some interesting uh, atmospheric dynamics associated with them. And one of uh, the interesting dynamics is uh, the creation of what's called a low-level jet. So it's just a peak in the winds um, down low in the boundary layer. So it's not the jet stream up you know, high at 30,000 feet. It's strong winds at you know, a few hundred feet to maybe a, a couple of thousand feet. Um, and we, ha we flew through um, several cases of that where we saw this um, really nice temperature inversion with a very strong low level jet. Um, and so that has implications for um, being effective at transporting warm air into the Arctic. And we made uh, a series of flights where we could see warm air being invected, transported by um, these strong winds uh, into the central Arctic. Um, but then it also has implications for ice dynamics that if you get these strong winds and the momentum mixes down to the ice surface, it can um, add stress to the ice and cause leads to form and, and, and the ice to move around a bit. So I'm real excited to analyze those cases um, a bit more. Um, the other thing that's nice, I've done these small drone flights with other platforms in the past in the Antarctic, and we've never had instruments on board that measured turbulence and really the turbulence um, is what's doing all the transporting between the atmosphere and the underlying surface. And so having that turbulence data um, is something that I'm really excited to, uh, to dig a bit more into. Great. Thanks, John. And I, I know uh, we have a bunch of hands now. Stephanie was next, and then we'll get to Cheryl, Josie, and Mary. So Stephanie, go ahead. Great. Um, for the drone, I know you mentioned that you had trouble with the bungee cords, mm -hmm. but what about the batteries? Because I know you said that it had batteries in it. Yep. Um, so um, I've flown battery powered drones in the Antarctic as well and in temperatures colder than what we saw in Mosaic. Um, and the first time I did winter, polar winter flights with, with battery powered drones, I was, I was really concerned about the batteries. Um, if you have a way to keep the batteries relatively warm right up until you do the flight, um, they perform surprisingly well. We maybe would see a 10 or 15 percent reduction in um, uh, the the flight time we'd expect if we were in warmer conditions, um, but that was something that we we could manage pretty well. Um, one thing that we never really figured out is that it seemed like the plane was um, maybe a bit underpowered compared to what we um, had experienced flying it in more uh, mild conditions. Um, and that might have been a, a battery and a cold problem as well, that we just weren't getting enough current from the battery in, in the cold conditions we were flying in. Um, so that made it difficult when we'd get into these low-level jets where the winds were, you know, 20 or 30 miles an hour. Uh, 
uh, the plane would struggle a little bit to, to make headway in those strong winds. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, uh, Cheryl, why don't you go next? Hi, thanks, that was an amazing presentation. Um, my, uh, I, I'm really curious about the questions that you have at this point. Um, if you could go back uh, tomorrow and, and start doing things. I always try to get my kids thinking about the best questions that they can come up with in, for research. Mm -hmm. um, and I love to use, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Like what are the best questions that, that are kind of emerging in your mind right now about this environment and about, I, one of my questions was about turbulence and its impact mm -hmm. on sea ice, but the other was more just a general. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know. I think, you know, the, the science questions that we went up with probably would be similar to the ones I would go with now. I think the bigger change if I was going now, but knew what I knew from having been there previously, um, would be, um, just related to the environmental conditions that we were working in. Um, you know, so maybe to, rather than really wanting to have a fixed site where we were doing our flights from, you know, where we had a tent and things like that set up to maybe be a bit more flexible and to, to really, um, have just a sort of pop-up site where we could go depending on where um, the leads were and where we could get to on the ice rather than you know having leads open up and separate us from uh, the, the camp that we had set up um, to just be able to say oh we can't fly where we flew yesterday we'll go and fly somewhere else today um, that would be really nice um, you know and then just the lessons you know we had some issues with um, motor problems early on um, that took a little bit to, to sort out, to fix with the drones that were related to the cold. Um, so just having all of that experience of, you know, how to deal with the bungee in the cold, how to keep the batteries warm in the cold. We, we basically had a big um, ice chest that we put heating pads in and we'd heat it up on the ship, stick all our batteries in there and then take, get, take it out onto the ice for the day when we'd fly and that would help keep the batteries warm. So just all of those um, things about dealing with the environment would have been nice to know going in rather than having to figure them all out you know in the first couple of weeks we were there so we would have been able to to start flying a little bit quicker great thanks and, how, and josie yeah thanks again for the presentation fascinating um yesterday we talked about the class about models and you know just a word that I'm not quite sure I understand, parameterization. Mm -hmm. Understanding how models have boundaries, I'm assuming. But did you find in your data set, um, are you finding maybe some uh, higher resolution data or is it still just kind of supporting the models that you already have? Or are you finding something interesting? Um, to add to the resolution of the models that your data is going to be inputted into. Yep. Yeah. So I'm uh, I'm fortunate in that I sort of split my research time evenly between field work as an observational scientist, but the other half of my research time I'm actually um, a model developer and I run uh, weather and climate models. And so I can very easily take the data that I collect and make use of it in, in the models. Um, and so, uh, you know, I said before that one of the things I'm really interested in getting from the observations we made is the turbulence data. And um, having that information about how strong the turbulence is, how it's related to the temperature profiles that we measured and the wind profiles um, will really be something that allows us to um, more carefully evaluate what our models are doing and, and the parameterizations that you talked about, they're just a way for the model to represent a physical process um, in a simplified way. And so the one that we're interested in is, is the ones that represent turbulence. Um, and so the model is predicting you know, some temperature profile that it's able to resolve with its vertical resolution and it's predicting a, a wind profile. And from those profiles, it estimates what the turbulence is gonna be and then calculates 
how effectively the atmosphere is going to exchange energy with the surface and the overlying atmosphere or exchange momentum. Um, and so the fact that we have turbulence measurements that we can use and look and see what our model is predicting in terms of turbulence intensity and how effective those exchanges are um, is something that's uh, unique that we haven't had in the polar regions before. And the boundary layer in the polar regions, the turbulence there um, is, a, is a longstanding problem for us as modelers to deal with. So having that data, I think, will, will let us shine a light on the shortcomings we have in our ability to represent that process in our models and, and hopefully uh, do a better job representing it moving forward. Awesome, thank you. Great, and we'll just do one more question before we break for lunch. Uh, Mary, go ahead. So I was wondering, um, with the leads, Mm -hmm. I didn't see any steam. Ah, let me. Um, uh, were they were they closing over or were they too big? Um, yeah. So, um, this picture you don't see any steam from the lead, and that's because this was actually a pretty warm day. The temperature wasn't all that much colder than um, the water temperature, and okay. so without that temperature gradient, you you won't see any steam. Um, here, if you look. In the background, you can see um, hints of steam coming off this lead, and, and um, it doesn't show up very well, but there was steam coming off uh, the lead right in front of the polar stern as well. So a lot of days, you know, I'd go up on the bridge. That was sort of my first stop every morning was to go up on the bridge, see what new leads had formed, what, what the flow looked like. Um, and you could look out, you know, the 360-degree view around the ship, and you could see plumes of steam coming off where any new open water was. Um, and, you know, at this time, this was middle March, um, it was still cold. And right. so if the lead wasn't actively opening, right, if the ice wasn't continually pulling apart, a thin, a, a skin of ice would form over the lead pretty quickly. Okay. And so you'd only see that steam for a little bit when the lead was actively opening. And then once the ice formed, that steam would, would go away, the steam fog would go away. But okay. we did see it pretty regularly. Okay. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. Well, great. Thanks for those great questions. And John, thanks so much for, for being here. I know even Lynn and myself, we, we have no idea. Uh, and so it's really great to, to hear from you. And um, we're going to, if it's okay with you, we've shared your presentation. We're going to clip this recording uh, and share it as a resource for everyone here. That sounds great. Yeah, it, it was a pleasure talking with all of you. And uh, yeah, thanks for all the questions and thanks for listening. Great.